I mean, pulmonary medicine has evolved quite a bit um, to some extent. I mean, but the same types of injuries, for instance, that people um, developed or had back in World War II still apply today. I mean, we were the military pulmonologists or the military physicians at the time were well aware of, of something called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Um, you know, they were seeing it all the time in Vietnam and there's actually pretty good literature and I've looked it up suggesting that the that even in World War II we knew about it to some degree. It wasn't well defined. Um, so when the civilian guys say, oh, we've, you know, we've, we have the syndrome and it's like, yeah, we're well aware of that. So um, I think, um, you know, clearly on the battlefield, the acute treatment of pulmonary injuries, you know, clearly has advanced quite a bit now. Back in World War II, we didn't have mechanical ventilation. You know, it was very shocking to me to go back and look, and when they put him to sleep, they gave him a mask and they put him to sleep and there was no mechanical. And so we've been able to do and take the technology and apply it a lot earlier in the battlefield. So once they hit the hospital, or at least the, the field hospital or the FAST teams, you know, the, that, that pulmonary issues are not as big of a problem. We're still going to face, I think, long-term uh, the same issues. You have a large group of people um, going to different places, and like you said, you know, they're all dusty environments right now. It would be nice if we went someplace um, that wasn't so dusty. Um, and not... Um, and, and better, better able to define the extent of disease pre and post deployment. I think that's, that's the biggest thing we have to do is, and we've talked about this with the Defense Health Board um, and some of the recommendations that came out. You know, we need to add a few more pulmonary questions to when they come back. We need to do, uh, probably need to do some specific screening for specific groups of people. Uh, we know, for instance, the firefighters in the Air Force, they all get screened because of their exposures. You know, are there, and we're trying to define that. We don't want to do it on everybody because it doesn't really help, but are there specific individuals? And probably the, 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 probably the most important thing is when a service member comes back from deployment or even if they're not deployed, I mean, to take this, you know, address the symptoms as comprehensively as you can and do all the different things in terms of testing or whatnot to get a good handle on that. I think one of the problems, and we don't see this just with military, but in civilian population as well. You know, you're young, you have asthma. Well, there's a whole list of things in books that I can show you that's not asthma. And, and, and there's other things that we see in the military that our civilian counterparts don't see. If, you know, we see a lot of patients who present with disease earlier because they have, you know, we force them to run, we force them to exercise. If you were civilian and you weren't forced to exercise, you just don't, you don't go to see the doctor, but we see them a lot more. So, so there's some very different types of diseases related to exercise that we see and, um, and, and you know, and trying to address those and face those. So, I, you know, there's still always going to, just depending on where we go, and who we're dealing with, there's going to be the acute problems, and then there's going to be the chronic problems, just related to being in a different environments. So.